Hi, I'm Jen Chavez, and it brings me great pleasure to say that you are listening to the very first episode of The Evergreen. It's a brand new podcast from OPB about the beautiful and complex place you call home, the Pacific Northwest. I've called the Northwest home for almost 17 years now. I remember driving up the West Coast with all my stuff crammed into a beat-up Mitsubishi, ready to meet my very first day as an Oregonian. Looking for the exit from my first Portland apartment off Highway 205, I recall my amazement at the trees. They were everywhere, even in the city, here on the side of the interstate. So much green. I felt intuitively that I was in the right place. I've always felt comfortable among trees. The giant sequoias and pines of the Sierra Nevada, the coastal redwoods of the Santa Cruz Mountains, and now the evergreen forests of the Pacific Northwest. Like us, evergreens weather the seasons. In the life of a forest, they may burn, only to grow again. Even after they die, evergreens support a wide diversity of life. These trees live in community, And below ground, they're connected to networks of roots and fungi that help them grow. In a similar way, I feel connected to this place and to all of you who are my neighbors and all of those before us. So we're exploring what it is that connects us to the Pacific Northwest and to one another on the Evergreen. Every week, we'll bring you a story about the places and people and sounds and experiences and struggles and joys that exist here. On this podcast, we'll learn about each other and work together to understand what makes this place this place and the role we play in helping it grow. For this, our first episode, we thought we'd start it off with the idea of home itself, What makes where you live your home? What is it that makes us feel at home here? What does at home even mean? We at The Evergreen have been asking these questions lately, and we've gotten some pretty good answers. Stick with us as we explore in a moment. It's The Evergreen from OPB. I'm your host, Jen Chavez. Lately, we've been asking our fellow Pacific Northwesterners what makes them feel at home here, including ourselves and including you. That's something we're going to be doing a lot of, by the way, asking you what you want to know, what you think, and how you feel. The first answer is from our listener, Natalie, an Oregon master naturalist and avid wanderer of the forest near her home. I'm Natalie De Silva, and we're here at Tryon Creek State Natural Area in southwest Portland. And this is a place that for a long time I've been calling my second home. This is a temperate rainforest, and I was just amazed that here within the city of Portland, there's this beautiful forest and that, wow, the trails just go on forever. I come here maybe two or three, maybe four times a week to walk. I lead hikes for the public. I really feel that I want to help others appreciate, understand, and learn to love the natural environment. I love this little tributary and the little riffles of water. There's even a tiny, tiny waterfall up ahead. Sometimes when it's quiet and my mind is quiet (laughs) um, and I'm observing things, I write haiku. And there was one that I remember writing last spring. I noticed the buds on the Oso berry, but there had been a snow. So I wrote, winter snow, spring's buds, seasons in competition, which one will prevail? When I come to a place like this, I really feel like I've come home. I never feel 
lonely. I like to hike by myself because um, I'm out here to experience this place and learn about it. And in doing that, I feel like I learn about myself. What's really important to me and the person who I want to be in the world. Thank you so much for reaching out to us and sharing your haiku with us, Natalie. I can definitely relate to feeling poetic in nature. And perhaps it won't surprise you to know that many of us here at OPB also feel at home when surrounded by the natural world. Alex Zielinski covers Portland city government for OPB. And to answer this question, she brought us along on a hike with one of her favorite hiking companions. My career as a reporter has taken me across the country to places I never thought I'd call home, like Texas and Washington, D.C. But regardless of where I've lived, I found solace in the one place that always feels like home, nature. In Portland, that can look like a summertime swim in the Sandy River or a bike ride down the Springwater Corridor. Today, it's a muddy December hike in the Hoyt Arboretum. The Arboretum sits on a ridge in Washington Park in Portland's Southwest Hills. It's home to more than 2,300 tree species, both native to the Pacific Northwest and not. It's also a habitat for thousands of birds, mammals, and other animals. The park, which is co-managed by the city and a nonprofit, calls itself a living museum. It's on full display today, even in the depths of winter. Oh, like a chickadee. I'm here with the person who first introduced me to nature. Bill Zelensky. My dad is a retired wildlife biologist. He and my mom moved to Portland from my hometown in Northern California a few years ago. My mom is also a naturalist. As a child, I always complained when my parents took me on weekend hikes through the nearby redwood forests. They'd stop every few minutes to identify a bird call or quiz each other on tree names, and I'd roll my eyes. Now it's where I feel most at peace. My dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's eight years ago. He moves a little slower and speaks a little softer than he did when I was a kid. But he can still identify nearly every plant and animal on display at the Arboretum. Western hemlock. This is, this is a red cedar, yeah. Douglas tree squirrel. Nice little area with the ferns. This is a deodar cedar. It's a kinglet. On our hike, we pass evergreen trees coated in lime green moss, clusters of sword ferns bursting out of the damp forest soil, and small streams hidden under shrubs. A light rain starts to fall, muffling the sounds of nearby traffic and planes overhead. This is an urban forest, but it's easy to feel miles away from civilization. Like me, my dad finds comfort in spending time in the woods. Well, I think it's... I think the Japanese coined the phrase forest um, bathing is because it kind of clean, cleans you, cleans your soul, cleans your heart. I always feel renewed and refreshed. I might not know the Latin names of every tree we passed today or recognize the birds that serenaded our walk, but like anyone lucky enough to grow up outdoors, it still feels like coming home. That's Alex Zelinsky, Portland city government reporter for OPB. Speaking of which, one of the things we're most excited about at the Evergreen is that we're going to have all our OPB friends and colleagues like Alex come through all the time. They're out here every day doing brilliant work to help us understand the region we call home. It's past, present and future. And we are very lucky to get to harness their superpowers and help share the stories they uncover with you. One of our OPB friends that I've long had the privilege of working with is the evergreen producer, Julie Sabatier. She helped inspire me to be more confident in myself as a public media newbie who came up in local community radio. I am so excited that she's part of the team bringing the evergreen to life. For Julie, home's not just where you live, but the people who are there with you and the excitement you share at familiar sights and sounds on your block. 
There are a lot of sounds in my home. <laughs> Yay, draw two. Bah. Extra, extra I need to in your with face. Power suit. Swim with the other in shark. your face. I'm Olaf, and I like warm hugs. <laughs> Most of the noise is generated by the youngest people in the house. My name is Warren, and, and I'm going to tell you this stuff I said. Warren is five, and I am seven. The seven-year-old is Owen. Owen. Henry Cecil. There's one thing that never fails to cut through the noise and stop Owen and Warren in their tracks. You can't do that if you're changing it. Jeez! Oh, there's the fire truck. From our living room window, we can see the fire station across the street. And every time the garage door opens, it's an event. It's coming! It's coming! Oh, it's coming our way. The firefighters don't usually turn the siren on until they get down the street a bit. But we can hear the heavy vehicles trundling by, especially if they're moving fast. Sometimes if we're outside and they see us waving, they'll ding the bell. And of course, we can always see the lights. Yeah, at night. During the day, it's just like, the lights don't really show up. We've lived in this house for five years, and I assume at some point the fire station will stop being exciting. But it hasn't happened yet. Every time we see the red and blue lights, the kids run to the window to see if it's the engine or the truck. The fire truck has six wheels and is like four times as big as a car. The fire engine is like twice as big as a car and has four wheels. Fire trucks, they are red and they have sirens. And sometimes firefighters can even team up with Dalmatian dogs. They get a call when there's a fire, which everybody knows. Yeah, and then you can tell from outside because there's a little light and it blinks. Whenever we see a fire truck out in the world, we always check the number on the side to see if it's from what we think of as our fire station. Sometimes my partner and I catch ourselves doing this even when the kids aren't with us. One time, I was having lunch with a friend and the fire truck passed by on the street. I heard it before I saw it. I could see our station's number on the side as it went by, and I got a little excited. I had to catch myself before interrupting our grown-up conversation to shout out, fire truck! So I guess even when the red and blue lights are no longer thrilling for my kids, hearing the familiar rumble of fire vehicles will probably always make me feel at home. If you ever need help fighting a fire, they're the ones to call. Bye! <laughs> That's the Evergreen producer, Julie Sabatier. Another one of our colleagues here at OPB with a tiny person in their home is OPB Central Oregon Bureau Chief Emily Curitan Cook. And lately, that's helped her reconnect to a feeling of home she remembers from her childhood, spending time with animals she loves. For a long time, I thought of myself first and foremost as a journalist. More than $4 million authorized through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law will go towards restoring wetlands and stream banks of the Crooked River near Prineville. <laughs> <laughs> then in 2022, I also became a mother. The funding comes as runoff from farms pollutes the river. <laughs> okay. You want me to stop talking? I think you need a snack. Having a baby turned my world upside down. Being needed all the time forced me to grow in new ways. And it also made me want to do something a little selfish, something just for myself. So I returned to a childhood obsession. Horses. I started taking riding lessons for the first time since I was a kid. I'm not going to lie, this is expensive and time consuming and dangerous. But for me, the payoff is worth it just like it is for lots of people who feel most at home in a barn. People like Lisa Jones from Bend. I got bucked off last week, but I, I learned something. Or Catherine Nolan from Prineville. Well, when you have horses, the chores never stop. <laughs> Between feeding, hay, cleaning, brushing, riding, doesn't stop. <laughs> and if you think you're done, you're not. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you're saying that's part of the joy for you. It is. It very much is. I love it. 
My name is Riley and I live in Sisters, Oregon. I'm 17. Riley is tossing hay to a barn full of horses who are anxious to see her. Hi buddy. This is Swayze, he's my favorite horse in here. I cannot lie. <laughs> He's ready for his dinner. Yeah. He's making sure everyone in the barn is aware that he's ready to eat. My name is Lisa Jones, and I own Swayze. I can go and spend my money on a, on a fancy car or a bigger house, but that, at the end of the day, isn't going to bring me joy. Coming out to the barn every day, getting on him, even if it's not a good ride, by the end of it, I've had some peace. I learned something. My name is Violet Addington. I live in Bend, Oregon, and... How old are you? Oh, I'm 11. I would, like, live in the barn if I could. What are you doing right now? Um, taking her blankets off so I can put the tack on and groom her. Ah. Um, what have you learned from riding horses? Uh, a lot of confidence and a lot of balance, like physically and mentally. If you're in a state where you can't process things, like after a rough day at school and then I'll ride and then I'll feel much better for just riding and like being with them. Who are you riding today? Lavender. When I was Violet's age, I also would have lived in a barn if my mother let me. Now that I'm all grown up, being around horses still feels like home. And it reminds me to be grounded in qualities like balance, patience, and calmness. Because when I take those feelings back to my real home, it makes me a happier person and a better mom. <laughs> yeah. That's Emily Curitan Cook, Central Oregon Bureau Chief for OPB. And as an appreciator of the Patrick Swayze cinematic canon, I gotta give a special shout out to Swayze the horse. In a moment, more on what makes the Pacific Northwest a home for all of us who live here. It's the Evergreen from OPB. I'm Jen Chavez. And we're continuing our exploration of what makes us here at OPB and you out there listening feel at home in the Pacific Northwest. For Crystal Ligori, the host of OPB's All Things Considered, it was hard to put a finger on what feels like home right now. And I understand. Sometimes at home there's an absence and sometimes a space for new love. As of 2024, I've lived in Portland for longer than my childhood hometown in Wyoming. And yet when I heard the prompt of what makes you feel most at home, I was kind of stumped. Growing up in restaurants, it seemed like that could be an obvious choice, as did my favorite karaoke bar in North Portland, where I'd spent many nights of my formative years. But then it hit me. What feels most like home is something I'm currently struggling without. A dog. Oh, he's awake. He heard, we, he woke up we're laughing at him. he heard us laughing at him. Owen! For nearly all of my life, I've had a canine companion, a trio of childhood dogs, two sets of roommates with different pugs, and then our own dog. Owen, sit. Good boy. Can you spin around? Good boy. A sweet boy my partner and I got outside of a Walmart when we lived in Montana. Are you ready to go outside? Are you ready to go outside? Oh my God. <laughs> okay, you looking good there. You looking so good. You're but before the holidays, our senior pup Owen passed away. And home, the home we knew for the previous 14 and a half years, is somehow gone. Silence has taken the place of the jangle of dog tags early in the morning and the frantic tap dancing on the hardwood floors before dinner.
There's no longer a star for our many made up songs. Fifteen minutes before it's dinner time. It's not time yet. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not time for dinner. <laughs> but this idea of home, my idea of home, it has a lot of room for the dogs that came before Owen and for the future pups that come after. Here we go. There he is. <laughs> the time has finally come. Thanks for letting us show up so late. What do you think? Hi, buddy. He's starting to get a little whiny. I'm like, he's like, all my friends are Hi. And while my home may look different in the future, Gene, don't tear that up. Gene. The one thing I do know is that it will be covered in dog hair. Gene. That was OPB's All Things Considered host, Crystal Ligori. Crystal, thank you. I am so glad Owen and these memories could be a part of this podcast. You know, it strikes me listening to all these stories that we at OPB have such an array of different places and experiences that have brought us or kept us home here in the Pacific Northwest. And we know that's the same for you out there. Maybe you're a Northwest lifer. Maybe like me, you came here as a younger person building a life for yourself. Maybe you're not physically here anymore at all, but you still got love for the Pacific Northwest in your heart. Or maybe you're new here. Welcome to the neighborhood. The Evergreen producer Mia Estrada joined us from Texas last year, and Girl is an endless font of wonderful and creative ideas. She has got great things in store for y'all. As a newer Pacific Northwesterner, Mia's still building her sense of home here. Sometimes it's not just a physical place, but a particular sound or smell that can make you feel at home. One thing that can be comforting for everyone is food, especially the particular cultural foods you grew up with. Mia talked to her Abuela Minerva about her homemade tortillas and filled up her new place with the beloved scent of tortillas from a recipe that's been in her family for at least four generations. Every time I enter my grandma's house, there's a particular smell that stands out to me. An intoxicating, flowery aroma. To me, my grandma's flower tortillas are one of the best smells ever. And since I moved away from home, I wanted to learn how to make tortillas on my own. So I called up my grandma on Zoom for a cooking lesson. How long have you been making tortillas for? I was probably 17 or 18 years when I started. What are your memories with them? Well, being there with my mama, smelling the good food and the tortillas she was making. And it reminds me that my mom used to make not just two cups. She would make a big ball of it. And so right now we're making a smaller version of it, right? Yeah. The recipe my grandma is teaching me makes up to seven flour tortillas. To start, add about a cup of water into a pot and let it warm up. Then in a bowl, add your ingredients. Two cups of all-purpose flour, one teaspoon of baking powder, one teaspoon of salt, and a tablespoon of lard. We're using manteca. Now it's time to knead the dough together into a ball with your hands. It should be a grainy-like texture. Okay, now we're going to get the water a little bit at a time, okay? Okay. So you don't want to make it too soggy. Once the dough is nice and smooth and not sticking to your hands, my grandma likes to spread a pea-sized amount of manteca all over the dough. When you're done with that, we're going to separate the dough into about one-inch rounds. You then add each round into a bowl and cover it with a towel. Some people like to let the dough sit for about 10 to 15 minutes, but we're going straight into rolling out the dough. And this is the good part. <laughs> Get your rolling pin, whatever you're going to use. I have using okay. a water bottle. <laughs> using That's okay. Water bottle. I used, I used the, the, the stick from the paper towels before. Okay, let's start doing it. Ooh, and am I rolling it out to make it even? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is where I had a hard time. My tortillas were not shaping up to be circles, and I wasn't thinning them out as much as I should have. Mia, look at me the way I do them, baby. Look, I turn it, 
Then I go like this. Mine, you know what mine is? It's from a broomstick. Wait, oh, you like took it from a broomstick? Yeah, my dad made it for me when I got married. He sent it to me to California. That's amazing. Yes, I still have it. Now that the tortilla is rolled out, add it to the comal or cast iron griddle. You can also use a regular pan like me. Let the tortilla sit for about 10 seconds or until you start to see small bubbles form. Then turn it over and repeat until it puffs up. I think this one is finished. Still not the right shape yet, but... You're going to be like that, baby, because we're just starting. Hey, mama, that's United States right there. <laughs> that's the United States, yes. Uh-huh. That's what we used to say when we didn't know how to... Uh, you see a person not making it right. Ah, it's okay. That's Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still practicing making flour tortillas, but there's something about the process of making them and spending time with my grandma that takes me back to my childhood. The smell alone reminds me of home, and I have my grandma to thank for that. That was the evergreen producer Mia Estrada and special guest Mia's abuelita. Mia, I am looking forward to trying your tortillas sometime. Some of us look to other people for our sense of comfort and home. And some of us find peace in solitude, getting away from the noise of the city and taking in the quiet sound of the river lapping the shore. This audio postcard comes from our listener, Bob. I'm Bob Turtelot, and I live in Portland, but I keep a boat on Multnomah Channel, and we're at Island Marina on Multnomah Channel, um, accessed off of Soviet Island. I can see from where I'm standing about 100 yards of water, which is the width of the channel. There's a rank of trees, most of them cottonwoods. There's a few sycamore and um, alders in there that have grown along both banks. The channel curves away to the north and to the south and looks a little like a canal in France or in um, Holland. Uh, It has that feel to it. While you're on Multnomah Channel, you're close to both banks and the wildlife that uses the river, um, otters, raccoons, possum, all the birds, uh, they're very close to you. And being in a boat, you're very quiet. And if you just chill and pay attention, uh, there's quite a show here and it's right next to you on both sides. I spend quite a bit of time here. It's a good place to um, be quiet and uh, reflect and get absolutely nothing done. And I never feel as connected as I do when I'm particularly in familiar water. And these are my home waters. It's remarkable this close to a city the size of Portland that this exists and that in 25 minutes, you can be um, in a place that doesn't remind you of a, of a city at all. And so let's just keep it a big secret, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for reaching out to us and bringing us along to your home waters, Bob. When I think about feeling at home here and what makes this region special to me, As much as I think about the trees, I also think of all the water that flows through this region and meets our shores. And this last one is from me, because I also feel a deep sense of connection with familiar waters. And sometimes those waters are an entire ocean. Beep, beep. Who's got the keys to the Jeep? I'm driving to the beach. Top down, loud sounds. (laughs) That's me. On the road, headed west to the place that makes me feel most at home, the beach. As I hit 101, the ocean opens up before me. 
before long, I pull into the parking lot of one of my favorite Oregon beaches, Short Sand Beach in Oswald West State Park. Here we are. As I start the hike to shore, the highway noise fades into the sound of Short Sand Creek rushing toward the ocean. The forest is dripping with moss, carpeted with ferns, replete with mushrooms. It's a good time to think. I think about how I've been a West Coast beach baby my whole life. For the first few years I was alive, I lived in Pacifica, a beach town just south of San Francisco. My mom tells me she took me to the beach every weekend when I was a baby. I realized that actually explains so much about me. I think the ocean is like hardwired into my brain somehow, from before I can even remember, when I was still forming my identity. It still draws me toward it like a magnet today. I come here all the time. You guys, I just got to the part of the trail where you can see the beach. It looks so nice. We're almost there. All right. The trees open up into a sunny cove. The creek becomes the ocean. The mist rises off the waves into the light as they crash. The tide is high right now, and most of the beach is covered with these smooth rocks that kind of click against each other when the water passes through them. As is hallowed gen tradition, I do a little frolic in the waves. Woo! Enjoy a beach picnic, which today is a tofu banh mi. Mmm, that's good. And as I sit on the shore, I close my eyes and notice my other senses. I feel the unseasonable warmth of the sun on my cheeks and ankles. I smell the salty air, and I hear the waves. The waves feel like breathing in and out. I do that too. The ocean is more massive and deep than I can imagine, with a bajillion animals just swimming around in there. Standing here looking at it, I feel small in that good way, like I'm at the edge of the world and at the beginning of something new. Love you, ocean. See you later. Thank you for listening to my Ode to the Beach. And I am so happy and grateful to be standing here at the beginning of something new with you. I cannot wait to explore this place that we call home with you. If you feel inspired to make an audio postcard about what makes you feel at home in the Pacific Northwest, we would love to play it on a future episode. Thank you so much for listening to the very first episode of The Evergreen, our newest podcast from OPB. We'll be back next week to bring you the story of the magnificent Darcel 15 and her legacy in Oregon's queer communities. If you're here listening right now, you are a part of our brand new podcast family. Help us grow by leaving a review on your favorite podcast app. Follow us there and hey, tell your friends. This episode was produced by me, Jen Chavez, Mia Estrada, Julie Sabatier, and Sage Van Wing. Our technical director is Stephen Cray. He engineered this episode. You also heard stories on today's show from OPB's Alex Zelinsky, Emily Curitan cook and Crystal Ligori. And from our new friends in our audience, Natalie De Silva and Bob Turtelot. The music you heard in this episode is from Audio Network. If you ever have a question, comment, or suggestion for us, please hit us up. You can reach us by email at theevergreen at opb.org. I'm Jen Chavez. Catch you later. Sheriff, what kind of fantastic trees have you got growing around here? Big, majestic. Douglas firs. Douglas firs.